Hey. Okay. So we're on. Got this whole thing set up. Rough one. Oh boy, slaughtering the dogs. Yeah, baby. No, no. <laughs> so yeah, no. You can see from the the topic. Uh, the idea is to talk about compilations and uh, the history of compilations as a as a tool, but also when we talk about UCDs, um, compilations were hugely a factor and a, and a flavor of um, the whole underground DIY, et cetera, whatever. And that changes here, essentially. Things like a factory sample, the first release from Factory Records is a double seven inch of different artists. Um, and this is the first release on the screen here ever by Beggar's Banquet. The catalog number for this is B-E-G-A-1, Bega 1. So you think about the fact that Beggar's becomes one of the three dominant, you know, music distribution, production, etc., you know, um, entities in the world down the line. And it starts here, you know, this is this is Ur comp essentially. And it is, you know, like John Cooper Clark was on the factory sample too. Um, like, you know, he's a stand up comic. He f famously does this, this routine called evidently chicken butt, which is um, sort of iconic. It's, you know, it's this, um, I think he's Mancunian, but you know, they get very particular about place uh, over there. But you know, it's this rambling, stumbling kind of uh, hilariously drunk monotone nonsense. Uh, that he used to do live um and so you know again the compilation is is something that that you know punk for lack of a better term um r takes from being what had classically historically been an advertorial you know accessory something you give to sales reps and to djs to try and showcase your label like here's rca's greatest stable of 1967 and you know a m records hottest new artists and you know i mean every label that's the only place compilations that's the only purpose they were seen to serve and it wasn't until the notion of do-it-yourself and independent labels and all this stuff in the late 70s really um, that the notion of the compilation mostly is an economic pragmatic decision because, you know, we can't afford to be putting out albums and singles dedicated by artists, you know, year over year, blah, 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 you know, it's shoestring budget. It's literally the idea of doing this when you cannot afford to do it. And so everybody kind of puts their money in the pot. It's got this whole different flavor to it. And so the idea, you know, when you're talking about collecting UCDs and trying to find value in, you know, building a music collection, a physical music collection that's not going to bankrupt you, um, the compilation in the 1990s started to function the same sort of way again. You know, I don't know what it was. Is it, is it Fugazi? Is it, you know, Discord? What is the thing that made everyone want to start their own label? in the nineties. Well, one, it's an up economy. So, you know, after Clinton gets in all of the, you can't, it's difficult to explain if you didn't live through it, but there was a massive shift in terms of like general, um, economic, like disposable income, et cetera, went up pretty heavy in the nineties. And like the UK sort of trailed the U S by say two or three years. So, you know, the U S peaked sort of first with this and then you, you know, Brit pop is a reflection of it in the UK, but in the nineties, in all the cities in the States, you know, it had been happening in the eighties, of course, but in the eighties, there's like, you know, 10 ish labels, you know, you got your touch and go coming out of a fanzine. Um, you got, um, you know, discord in DC, you got homestead up here in Massachusetts, but it's not like an enormous, um, you know, thing in the nineties, all of a sudden everybody started labels and, you know, they would do like two releases and be like, I'm broke like me, <laughs> which my, my first attempt at a record label out of college when I was like, I'm going to be, I get to be my Tony Wilson fantasy now. And I put out like two CDs and it's seven inch or something. And it was like, I can't afford this at all because they didn't sell shit and they, they never do. Um, I'm part of a, a record label now I'm, I'm helping finance and, and, you know, eventually this whole thing will be potentially separate if it, if it does well. Um, sorry to hear if you're dropping frames, uh, jock, but the, I'm not seeing any drops where I am and I'm watching, I have a monitor over here on Wi-Fi. So if there's something up with the quality or somebody's seeing something, let me know, but I don't know. It seems okay here anyway. Um, yeah, it just, everybody started labels and they'd put out like four, seven inches, you know, they were able to do it in college because disposable income, I don't know what it was. Um, obviously 
look, there's a component of class to it. Like there's not a ton of DIY labels started by black African American kids that were in college. Like it wasn't an impulse that that whole thing, that whole culture was completely different during the explosion of hip hop at the same time that, you know, indie becomes this thing in America, which is like totally different than landfill indie or the, the, the very, posy um genre style use of the word indie in england which goes back to the 80s to c86 and jangle the way indie is used in in the uk you know being the other major major pop music market um is totally different from the us from the u in the us it's very much like a class intention um you know sort of pejorative term that has to do with the notion of diy and doing it yourself and it means generally like a lot of the bands sucked, like technically they were terrible and you know, they would have one or two songs and then they would have like variations on that song and, and like, that's it. And, and you had just hundreds and hundreds of bands and towns, cities all over the States that would do, um, you know, one or one or two singles and then break up. And it was just like college kids were all forming bands and playing shows. And it was just this weird thing. It's, it's gone. It's been gone for a long time. Having lived through it, I, you know, it, it was like the 80s on steroids because, you know, in the 80s, there were tons of awful, shitty REM ripoff college bands playing in every town, you know, in Athens and Boston and in Ann Arbor and everywhere. And but they were like, you know, five, ten, like they're they were beaten down by the notion that like they weren't going to go anywhere anyway. So it was garage band kind of mentality, you know, and and a band that was anywhere near half decent could could kind of rise above that. And, you know, put out a record on Frontier or some shit. You know, there were a lot of large mid-tier indies. And they were there because there weren't that many bands. Like, the whole perspective of what it took to be a band and to be taken seriously as a band, it really radically changed. Hardcore was a huge part of this. Hardcore bands, it was like, one seven inch? Yeah, you'll be remembered forever. You know, one seven inch with eight songs on it. It's, you know... You go down the list, civil disobedience, citizens arrest, you know, like, I mean, some bands, of course, you know, Slapshot, there were big legastic hardcore bands that went on forever, Fugazi, you know, coming out of Minor Threat. But, you know, most hardcore bands, it was like one, two and done, you know, like Murphy's Law putting out a full length vinyl album was crazy. And two, you know, like um, Gangrene in Boston, like that record was so, so ghetto. You Like if you ever see older Budweiser or any of the gangrene LPs, like they look like, you know, they were run off and, and done in like an alley somewhere. Like the, the production value of independent stuff. And this starts right here, you know, with this beggars record and with all these um, comps that came out, the, the production value, the quality of compilations and of indie and seven inch and whatever was always dog shit. I mean, today, yeah, they're they're printed on a melted Tupperware lid. Exactly. I mean, the vinyl was. I mean, and this is the other thing. In the '90s, when I was doing it, the vinyl you were getting, you could see through it. It looks like coffee. You think that you've bought colored vinyl, like brown translucent vinyl. No, it's just shit. It's that thin that it's translucent. And I mean, that doesn't happen anymore. Now, like you know, vanity indie vaporwave people are pressing up 200 gram brick quality vinyl. You know, it's ridiculous. Um, because they've understood and they've proven that that's what the market wants. They want the perception of quality, which is a joke. I mean, t this channel is openly anti-vinyl culture, um, despite participating in and loving, you know, the object and yes, yes, yes. It's, it's not a legitimately superior form except as an object of art. Um, so anyway, the 90s like vinyl and the 80s vinyl that independent artists were doing was also really sketchy quality generally because um, it was expensive to do it. I mean, was it a, was it affordable if like four people in a band get together 200 bucks and all of a sudden we're talking about doing, you know, a thousand singles for 850 bucks or something at a local pressing. But yeah, that's what was happening. Um, and, you know, it was it was definitely like a flavor. And so when you're talking about going back again the key theme of like UCD value hauling and, and, and buying, you're predominantly going to be dealing with mid eighties to, you know, mid two thousands, let's say like 85 to 2005 CD is the dominant format, or at least it's, it's produced in enough quantity that that's a medium where there's a surplus. It's essentially perfect. It doesn't age unless you like destroy it. The whole idea of like CDs, you know, p pitting and the aluminum falling, like 
get out of here. Like, it's so absurd that people want to pretend this is a thing. It's not. I have CDs from 87 that look like the day they were bought. It's just like, did it get left in a car in the sun? Okay, yeah, it will degrade. But like, if it's stored inside the case, inside a home, you're fine um, forever, theoretically. <laughs> like, it's it's not going to happen. Um, you know, the, the utility value of CD obviously is gone. They're not in cars. <laughs> like, CD players are gone. People, you'd have to go build yourself a little home setup if you wanted to enjoy the tactile experience of CD, listen to it, etc. cetera. Um, you have rotational velocity density. Yeah, I mean, like, the disc man was a stupid idea for that reason. I mean, like, it's not a portable medium. It is a home stereo medium. But the most, what it is now is it's an archival medium. And that's why you want to consider this. Because despite, you know, the recent hype over the last two years, um, um, having been involved in this pursuit, you know, since about 2015, 16, as as literally an arbitrage opportunity as a music fan to build a sizable, physical, permanent collection that I can afford. Um, the, you know, I, I can tell you it hasn't changed that much. It's vinyl that's still going stupid and going off the charts and continuing to go for perceived scarcity money or, or you know, artificial scarcity of limited printings and color pressings and all this crap. CD depending on the seller, the seller may not understand that there is potentially an audience out there. Most of the Discog sellers, they're going to, um, they're going, the Discog sellers are going to look at the median price and the analytics that are available on Discogs, which is a great tool as a seller. It tells you sort of the market and what the market is bearing, what the market is expecting and what it's, you know, how it's moving. Um, so, you know, there are places, and I talked about it in the last stream, I talk about it probably in every stream, you'll find stores that are selling CDs for $15.99 new. And that's just like, go. Like, no, don't don't bother with that store. Because that store is in a mindset of either being back in 2001 when people were paying $18.99 for a friggin' CD, or they think that the market is hot and that they can get it. Um, you're tr you're, what's still out there and what you're trying to find... Um, Oh, sorry. Somebody in the chat here just mentioned there are a couple plants that had consistent disc raw problems. Yeah, no, there's no question. Like you, you, the the big the big companies, Sony, you know, principally Philips, et cetera, they developed the format. Yeah, there were plants that opened up in the in the early going of CD that like did not have the right equipment, and there they did not glue right. And like, yeah, there are. But it's an extremely rare phenomenon. Um, anything that you're likely to have heard of is not going to be affected by this. Um, yeah, no, seriously, it, it was like $17.99 straight up. That was the sticker on a CD in 2000, 2001, like definitely. And people were paying it. And like people were paying 30 bucks for warp imports. I was. I've talked about that before in like live streams a long time ago and stuff. Um, you know, like I'd buy a Square Pusher CD. It, you know, I, I'd pay 30 bucks for it new at like a Newbery Comics and like, boston because it's imported from the uk but like really does is does it is it doubling in value by coming over here somehow like i'm pretty sure all of that stuff's happening in bulk um it was a little silly at any rate so talking about compilations right and again the time frame that we're talking about so comps, like I said, they come out of they come out of punk. You know, you've got um, this is Boston, not LA, is a famous early example. This is an iconic one. This is also a horrible example of profiteering because this is a this is a legendary compilation. And and in a medium, you know, where you talk about collectibles and overpriced rarities and crap like that, the misfits hardcore are awful with this. You know, and this is one of those ones where if you look at this, it's totally gross. Um, you know, the, the repressings that have gone on, like they just did one, um, this year they did another one and like the covers, the color's not even right on the color on the cover. It's kind of like, what is this? Are you serious? Um, but it's a Newbery comics exclusive. And you know, there's some legitimacy to that because Newbery comics massively sold the original, uh, compilation, but it's like, you know, we've got bruise purple tricolor, um, you know, in addition to all the bootlegs and everything, but you know, this is one of those ones that's recently been latched onto, um, where it's become, you know, a, a reissue target because it's iconic. I mean, it's got some of my favorite Jerry's kid stuff on it. Um, really good gangrene. The freeze stuff is really probably the strongest in terms of bands that didn't really get their own discography going like proletariat and freeze have compilation CDs you can get. 
uh, and they're great. But you know, this works. It's not just like hardcore and punk, right? One of the one of the more famous ones too is Tuatara. So Tuatara is a compilation of Flying Nun artists from 1985. Um, I got hip to this by a record store clerk in the late eighties, uh, in Boston, who's also the drummer from mission of Burma. And this is like the original flying nun compilation. And this is something that labels would do to showcase their stable. Like this is how I would say almost anyone in America, the earliest you would have ever heard pink frost, which has become sort of a signature, like indie anthem, you know, for for guitar pop into underground stuff rock like that and i go wild by the bats too was also big this this album like got them out of new zealand this is this is how people became aware of flying nun and uh it's you know death and the maiden probably the catchiest tune arguably verlaine's ever wrote um it's uh it's just a, a huge hugely important example of how compilations were initially used by indie labels to to broadcast their staple and and it's a bit it was a big investment for them um to get it out there and to, you know to print it in quality and ship it and all that to get it out of new zealand is like not an inconsiderable task financially um and so they they did a sequel to it actually um that you can look out for um I don't know how I would find it quickly here for you, but there is a sequel um, called Getting Older, which was, I think, in 91. I'm just going to flood this out, see if I can pull it up real quick. Um, I also have this one on CD. And this one you can absolutely get for almost nothing because it doesn't have that same, you know, iconic, um, uh, you know, status, obviously, that Tuatara has. Um there it is getting older 81 to 91 so this was a uh, a significantly longer compilation it's a single cd though um which you know again i know because i have and by this time you've got belter space straight jacket fits you know life in one chord is is one of my favorite underground you know drone rock proto sort of shoegaze anthems ever um straight jacket fits were great um and and really you know they had a big run they did like four big albums all in a row you know melt and and a couple of others that are really pretty strong um consistently overlooked band you know for, when you think about other flying nun bands you know like like the chills obviously and now you know sadly we've had this tragedy with the clean um with hamish kilgore from the clean passing um you know that sucks and and um it's really sad you know obviously it's a brother duo that that formed the clean and 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 you know like merge records mac mccoff he he openly is like that first clean single is like this is what made me like get psyched to do anything to like become a, 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 an artist or a band it wasn't the first one i guess sorry boodle 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 and it was like hearing anything could happen and for him that was just like it changed his whole mindset and everybody who's ever pursued music as a passion has got those things that were like you know the 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 touchstone the thing that turned it on that that broke that switch of perceiving that you know music is one thing and only i can do this it's like you know, i swear i was there the 42 people who went and saw the sex pistols you know and they all form bands or whatever it's the same thing it's it, the record is the same function it's like i got this thing in the middle of nowhere i didn't know anything about it and i put it on and it was like i want to do that and the famous example obviously is the velvets i mean that's everybody has said that iggy pop all the people who were inspired by them it was like oh i don't have to be that good and you know the sex pistols always say that they're like we thought you had to come from another planet when we would see roxy music and you know even slade whatever you'd see these people and they were like dressed like space aliens and and on old gray and and totp and stuff and top of the pops and it just didn't seem possible and the independent bands you know it, it it hits person to person it's it's a personal thing which one of these bands or songs is the thing that turns you on but um you know all throughout these periods a lot of this stuff was getting resurfaced and the circle of you know influence and reach was getting expanded by compilations um and and when you think about you know what i was just saying about the value of cd you know let, let's look at the first the first edition and and the alternate brown sleeve okay there's one copy of the brown sleeve for sale it's in new zealand okay try getting that shipped anywhere i'm gonna pay a hundred bucks off the top to get this shipped on top of what they're asking which is not 
significantly less than um, for the brown iteration of the vinyl, right? And then the original, the real red one, okay, we've got eight copies for 23 on vinyl. There are none for sale in the United States. I'm not selling mine. Um, you know, if you're over in, in the UK, okay, there's one for 30 pounds. Okay. You know, that's not horrific. Let's take a look and see what the CD is and see what you can do, even with the original, because there's, there's repressings, I think, or alternate pressings. Uh, yeah, they reissued it in 90. This is, I think this is what I have. I, I don't doubt I have the original, but like, let's look at that. Um, none for sale, uh, for, uh, nope. Okay. So people are asking just as much for the CD. Interesting. Um, it's weird when you, when you see this, I, I would have assumed, I mean, this one's just rare, unfortunately. Tuatara is, is historic. And so, yeah, you're not making out on the CD of this one, but I'm, I would guess that getting older, you probably could, um, uh, there's only one copy of the vinyl and they're only asking 30 for it. Whoops. Um, you know, what does this CD go for? Be curious to see. Getting older. It's not too, too cheap. Uh, and again, none in the States for that and none for sale here. Wow. I don't know. Um, they, I mean, this is a pretty obscure, obscure example. What I was talking about more is when you start getting into the really big like this is a true indie comp this was not produced at scale it's not widely uh, available it wasn't printed in huge numbers but there were a lot of comps that were printed in huge numbers in the 90s and um you know one of the ones in particular i can mention that was uh you know just unbelievably common was the up records compilation stacked up now up is sort of unfortunately a sad story that founder uh I can't remember his name. Uh, he passed away from with cancer incredibly ahead of when he should have. It was really sad. Um, his label or their label, I'm not sure everybody that was involved. Uh, they came out big with Land of the Loops. So Land of the Loops is like the start of like bedroom electronica. Um, you know, it, it was, it was, there was, Slabco was doing this stuff for a while, for years really, before Up came together and put out Bundle of Joy. But I mean, this got licensed to a Miller a Miller genuine draft commercial in 1998. Like it was, he, he made some money uh, off that. And um, it's got some really, really great um, cute, but like, I don't know what anyone in 2022 would think of listening to this record today because it's so amateurish and sloppy, but that's its charm, right? If it has any charm for you, that's what it is. I mean, it's like the, the woman who sings on it, she's not a strong singer, but it's like that cute um, kind of high pitched, you know, manic pixie, pixie girl kind of voice and it got totally ripped off by len for steal my sunshine which is one of the most egregious like see ya we got your whole vibe moves ever like it, that's len song steal my sunshine that samples uh, more 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 by andrew true connection is 100 percent a lift of this dude's whole vibe and this guy was sitting in jamaica playing outside boston making this on a four track for years i mean he did the percival tape um, which I have on Slabco. Actually, I think I also have straight. No, I don't have straight out of Miller. That's the one I don't have. Um, and he also had this great EP called refried treats where he tried to like make it more polished and dreamy. Um, I dream in stereo and then also, uh, Ambien. These are, these are really cool. Um, it's like, you know, it's like he found out about DJ shadow. And so it went from being kind of like a K records twee kind of idea, um, to trying to, to po polish it a little bit because, you know, when you're getting calls about doing commercials, you know, I don't know how much he was offered. I heard a rumor from somebody who has a record label out there out West who might have had access to the real number and heard this, but I heard he got 35 grand for a uh, Miller genuine draft commercial, which in 1998, I mean, they were playing, they, I mean, they, they, you know, not long after that, they offered the strokes like $400,000 or something for, uh, to use someday or last night in a Heineken commercial. I mean, uh, you know, um, uh, what's his face has told that story. A bunch of Julian Casablanca's has told that story like three or four times. Um, but stacked up is, is one of these like label showcase things from a label that look was up in indie. Sure. But they were a very like well steeped indie. I mean, they, they did a lot. They, this is not like cassette culture. Um, you know, this is not like, we're, we're eating, um, you know, beans and bread. I mean, I'm sure they were, I'm not suggesting this is like some rich kids, you know, 
lark. But Up came out of the gate incredibly polished relative to what you would have expected from, let's say, a Slabco or any of the really like hand dubbed, you know, cassette like Shrimper out here that was doing a lot of the stuff with Lou Barlow. Um, yeah, Up was pretty polished. And I, I don't know the whole history of them, but um, the Jeep music tape. Yeah, yeah, I did. I, that's another Slabco favorite. I've got that one. I showed a picture of it. I, I, I posted it on... Um, on the the record label Twitter account, I was going through some old stuff in the in the uh, the dadzium down here in the basement. But anyway, the, um, one interesting thing about this, I'm well, it used to be the case. I'm not sure anymore because I'm not keeping up with what Built to Spill's been up to since 2000, 2000. But uh, um, this is where you can get Scarin. So, D like Doug March's like actual version of Scarin, not the Calvin version that's on the Halo Benders album. This is really beautiful. It was the B-side to uh, the Dystopian Dream Girl 7-inch, I think. Little, like, 1 minute 50 second, little jank. It's such an authentic, pretty little, beautiful song. And um, I, it's always stuck with me. It's one of my favorites. And this was the only place you could get it on CD, um, as far as I can remember. Uh, and, and so that was a good reason to have this. But it also, you know, it also introduced you to, you know, some of their other artists, which, I, you know, Caustic Resin never really took off. Um, and Mike Johnson ended up, he was on, he was the basis for Dinosaur Jr. at this point. Um, and his solo thing was not really that great. Sorry. But, you know, if you can find this for three ninety nine and you're a Built to Spill fan or, you know, you're of that sort of ilk, you know, that's, that's a good one. Um, you know, I'd, I'd be looking at, it was, it was really popular. Um, you know, it was a really popular move at that time. And, and there are just tons of examples of this um, if, when you're looking, you know, for, for CDs that might come out pretty cheap. Um, another obviously enormous one is the, the collection of all the Simple Machines 7 inches working holiday. Everyone had this. I mean, everyone. Um, there's the, the limited 2 CD and the original. And I mean, yeah, 745, I'd say absolutely worth it. Again, it's a complete... Um, it's a complete like collection of, of this seven inch series. That's as iconic as really anything in the history of independent, you know, American music. Um, and, and also, you know, a lot of this is really fun and good. Um, in, in you know, I don't, th yeah, the two CD one. Okay. So there's a bunch of these for sale. Um, not over here. Okay. Interesting. Wow. It looks like the two CD version went to, went to Europe mostly. Why would that? Oh, EFA distributed it. Oh, that's interesting. Huh. Um, so yeah, this is the live festival, um, disc that they did that they put out. Honestly, I mean, it's a neat curio. The, the main thing you, you'd be interested in, most people would be interested in is it has a Rodan track live. Um, you know, the rest of this, the Archers of Loaf per performance is great, but a lot of these, you know, look, this is a theme with a lot of indie bands at this time. They weren't very good live. They weren't very tight. And so, you know, this isn't like a blow the doors down thing. But if you can find it for, for good money, um, the two CD version, there's three or four, you know, interesting, worthwhile performances to have on that second live CD. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, oh, and it just goes on forever. There's so many examples of this. The Smitten Love Comp, um, you know, Jawbreakers on this. Uh, where's the, uh, where's the full version? So, you know, not many of these, some of these are, are like, you know, look, they were on small labels and there aren't many of them. So this isn't necessarily about like two ninety nine cheapest thing you can find. In some cases, you're not, you're not going to necessarily see these. And I mean, look, were most of the songs put out on compilations, you know, did, did Jawbreaker put House Sitter out on it, et cetera. I'm sure they did. Um, you know, the, the Grifters track, I don't know. Not sure about that. Um, but like, you know, Unwound, like the... These are these are major mile markers of what the flavor of this whole period was like. So when I see, you know, younger listeners getting introduced into the 90s and stuff, it's like like now everything's getting put into perfect editions and in box sets and everything and that's fine. But a lot of this music moved around on on like pretty small really like super DIY compilations. One in particular that, you know, I've I've always loved and never sold. And it looks like there's some, you know, I don't know why all this stuff is showing over there. So yeah, here, like right here, 
$4.98, 6 bucks, totally take that. Um, this compilation, like this, I, this came out like in a, a plastic sleeve. Like I, I don't think this was in a case. I think this, the Jake, the tray paper came in like a plastic sleeve and I had to like get a case for it. But, um, this is an incredibly crazy and fun compilation. Um, and it was just like, as soon as, you know, the person doing it called up and was like, Hey, we're doing a tribute to the Minutemen. All these bands were like, hell yeah, because the Minutemen's like the most credible, cool fucking thing ever. So everyone wanted to be involved. Um, and so, you know, you, you like Hazel's a band that hasn't really been talked about since I got a couple of their records. Um, but there, you know, this has like, uh, he got tsunami to do courage, um, me puppets game price of paradise, cracker bash world according to nouns. This is sick. So this is actually Watt, Mike Watt, uh, with Kira, their dose project. This, if you've never heard of this, um, uh, the first, uh, the comp, it's on, it's a CD comp CD only new Alliance put out this dose project, which is just him and Kira playing bass together and singing really quietly. Oh man. Taking away the fire. Like there's this stuff is so good. If you've never heard this, um, they, they cover uh, Pacific PCH Sonic youth PCH. Um, and don't explain is so beautiful. Like it's such good stuff. And they, in they really only did this one little thing. Um, I know this thing had come out, um, but I actually never checked this out. I guess I should, but it, it was just like, when this compilation came out of those first, uh, recording sessions, it's, it's so good. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, eight, well, these are, again, there's nobody in the States weird. It, this was, you know, new Alliance is another label where their stuff, you know, is not printed in, in large volume and they were consistently pretty interesting and good label. Um, but yeah, this thing has got Jawbox, like then and, and this, you know, Kim Gordon, free kit, her free kitten project with Julie Caffritz. Like he got everybody seems on this. Uh, the, the, are they the first song? No, Sparkle. Okay. Seems the second song. I mean, hearing Sue Young Park try to rip this ain't no picnic is pretty funny, but he doesn't. It's totally a twist. Um, you know, Thurston Moore, shit here party is like everybody just got up for this comp. Everybody. Loop, oh, Black Sheep, the Sebado Black Sheep. I love this. It's so fucking good. Um, and then there's like a cool interview with D Boone that, that they found and Unwound's on here. Like this thing is such a must. And like, I don't know where anybody would bring this up or talk about it, but you know, th there's a reason this stream is called part one. Cause there's just dozens and dozens of these compilations, um, that, you know, were CD based and CD was an affordable, you know, possible thing coming out around the, you know, the, this time for independent bands to, to, to be able to do CD. Suddenly vinyl was like, it wasn't worth it because, you know, it just wasn't as practical. Um, so yeah, I mean, th those were all pretty, pretty interesting, good comps. Um, I'm trying to think of what was another one around this time. Ear of the dragon. Uh, what was that? Like it's like not even to come up. Oh, there it is. This has who does this have on it? Versus, a miniatures on this. Oh, versus is on this. Yep, Ruby. Um, this uh, did Trouble Man unleash release any comps? Um, so I th I'm not sure if this is the album version of Hey Latasha, but anyway, I ha I don't know why I kept this. <laughs> There's gonna be something valuable on here. Um, Maybe the J Church song is is really is really ripping. There's a weird Dave Paho thing at the end of this. Um, Azure is on here. They're sort of mid. Uh, God, the damn builders. I must have kept this for either the A Miniature or Versus song. A Miniature is another band no one talks about. Um, this is a band that, you know, honestly at the time, they weren't considered that cool. Like Duster, they were just kind of mid. Like no one thought they were that great, but this one's going to come back. Like this is a band that's going to get a box set or some shit at some point, if it's not already in the works, Mark, T Mark time cruiser, like, you know, it's post grunge with a little bit of shoe gaze with a little, you know what I mean? It's like that whole, you know, heavy, thick hum kind of thing. Um, I mean, what I remember a miniature for is their, they appeared on the wire compilation whore. And they did an awesome, this is the best thing they ever recorded to me is their cover of a series of snakes, the wire song. 
And this comp is an absolute must own, but I think most people know that because of the My Bloody Valentine cover of MapRef. And you know, this is the wire song for a huge majority of wire fans. Um, and, uh, sorry. And, and so if you, you know, if you haven't somehow heard this, this is a legendary cover cover. I mean, it, it, he, Kevin Shields actually gets the sonic, like he gets the, the weirdest flanging phasing effects that were in the original cut that, you know, Mike Thorne produced for wire. It's such a forensic, incredible recreation and such a cool approach to take like not like like yes it's a my bloody valentine song it sounds like my bloody valentine but it also sounds exactly like the original um and it's just it's totally crazy yeah and, and i mentioned in the last stream their cover of we have all the time in the world which is again contains the uh the original article the louis armstrong articles kind of you know space and depth and and for that is so beautiful i mean yeah they really i agree they should have done like 500 covers that mbv could have done a cover album and it would have been f just phenomenal because the guy's ears were just nuts but um you know lee ronaldo's little whipped off fragile is pretty good too watts 15th is awesome he's totally in his own like he's himself but he's also paying tribute because these guys all loved wire i mean famously in the Minutemen's liner notes for i think it's for ballot result I think Watt says, thanks to Ian for writing one, two X U. Like, I don't think that he knew it was a wire cover back when minor threat was doing one, two X U. I, I mean, a lot of people didn't, and I don't know how that information would have gotten around unless Ian McKay just came out and was like, and now we're going to play a cover by wire. Like they kind of ended up owning that song in America in a way, because most people didn't know it was a wire cover. There are other examples of stuff like this too, where some band covers a song and no one actually knows it's even a cover. Like Seam does a cover of Driving the Dynamite Truck, which is by a band called Breaking Circus that never went anywhere. And the original's not bad. It's like mid eighties, 16th beat, mid tempo goth. But like, yeah, almost nobody knows that that's not a Seam song because they play it like Seam. Um, you know, those things happen. The other thing on this, the ex lion tamers is, is Jim Derogatis. So the music critic, Jim Derogatis is, he was a drummer in a wire cover band called the ex lion tamers. And what they did is they would play pink flag front to back live, including the space between the songs being exactly as long as it was on pink flag. It's actually a really fucking cool thing about Jim Derogatis. That a lot of people don't know. And it was so funny to wire that they had them open for them when they toured in the States. I think it was on the late, it might've been on the whir or eardrum buzz. It's, it's one of the late eighties or right when they were at their shit tail end of, of the second phase new order wire period. But anyway, they had them open for them because then they didn't have to play any of pink flag and call it like they all talk about it. They're like, it's fucking brilliant. We don't have to play any of the old shit because they get it from the opening band and they're as good at it and sound just like us. But anyway, so when they did this comp, you know, somebody obviously was clued in and knew that they really needed to get, um, you know, I don't know if it was Kevin Eden, but they needed to get them to be on this. So that was pretty cool. And of course they chose like a super arch weird, you know, wire song and on returning, uh, the bark psychosis three girl rumba is also pretty fascinating and then customized is the band that Pete Prescott did, um, after uh, volcano suns ended. He's the original, he's the drummer from mission to Burma that had come back and reformed. But, um, he uh he did a few records with matter i mean gerard coslow would put out anything pete prescott touched he was such a mission of burma head that was the most probably one of the most important bands to him growing up before he formed matter of records and so he always supported pete um which i thought was really cool i mean customize wasn't my favorite thing pete ever did i've said before is this band called the peer group that he did uh right after um customized broke up but he never released it um it was in the late late 2000 late late 90s early early 2000s um, when he was still at mystery train and, uh, it's just really cool. Like kraut rock shit. He, I have a CD of it, but I don't think any of it got released. It's on, it's on YouTube. Actually the, the bassist, um, oh, my brain is breaking. Who was playing bass in this? Um, let me just look it up. It's not even listed in his band role. You gotta be kidding me. That's not cool. Come on. I mean, I don't think they put anything out, but man, that's lame. Anyway, it was, it was really cool. It was, it was a good, good project, but this is a comp, you know, I'm surprised that we're not seeing more. This should be like relatively landfill prices, but it's not. 
Um, but yeah, working holidays is definitely one to look for that really, you know, gets bands from that time. Customized work. Okay. I just, it, whatever. I mean, it's, it depends on your thing. They, I, I love the, um, uh, the last customized record because it, it's getting more into that longer drone stuff. Um, the band of Susan version of the head is also really cool. Agreed. Agreed. But I think the funniest thing apart from the, my bloody Valentine song is that somehow that band, a miniature, I think they really came in with one of the strongest cuts on that comp. And, and to that point, they had just done like their first probably best sort of record and then broken up. So, you know, it was kind of funny. Um, uh, what was another, what was another good one I was thinking about bringing up? So we talked about piece together. Um, I, I talked about it anecdotally, um, during the, um, the Sinead O'Connor stream, but this is, this is one there's, th I mean, this should absolutely be available for nothing. And you're getting, um, you know, you're getting one of the coolest things my buddy Valentine's ever done. Yeah. It's everywhere. And, and again, like it's, it's got some really interesting stuff on it. As I mentioned, um, it, it, this is such a must for that money, like blurs Oliver's army is on there and it is pretty fun. Um, but yeah, that, and I talked about red, hot and blue. That's another one. These are like mainstream big artist compilations that you can get for nothing. And, um, and you, you absolutely should. So just to reiterate that, you know, these are, these are, there's thousands of copies of these available for nothing. And, um, they're actually good. Like they'll, they'll have three or four good songs you're getting for like three bucks, you know, permanently, digitally, whatever. So, you know, back to the nineties indies thing though. Um, you know, the big one is the, you know, the elephant in the room, the two elephants in the room are no alternative and born to choose. So no alternative was like the dream set list from heaven. It, they got everybody, it's, you know, they, when they, the hardest thing was getting Nirvana. Like they were super touch and go about this whole thing, touch and go. Um, but they ended up getting, you know, all the biggins and, you know, Buffalo Tom for all to see, this is the best song they ever did. Um, I say, I've said before, this song essentially out super chunk, super chunk. It's so a beat out of control, fun, but not fun, funny. Like it's, it's upbeat, but it's still wistful. Um, it's, it's really faster than the drummer could play. Um, but you got, there's crazy good shit on this. I mean, yeah, a lot of it ended up elsewhere. Like Glennis is such a beautiful ballad from the pumpkins peak. This is kind of a wonky jokey song from pavement. Um, but you know, the, the version of sexual healing by soul asylum, I know, but it's not that bad. <laughs> They went for it. I mean, you know, like, fuck it. it, it it's, I kind of, I kind of give them, you know, I give them a little bit for that. And this is the tail end of straight jacket fits whole period too. You get Iris live from the, from the breeders and the beasties doing new style live. Like this thing's legit good. You got the Verlaines on here too. Like there's this cross pollination with flying nun. Um, but this thing was just, is, was just stupid everywhere. I mean, it originally came with this dumb shirt. Um, I did not buy the shirt edition and I also changed the cover because inside there's other pictures and you can like, you know, there's one of a girl with pigtails that's green and I made that the cover because you're not going to tell me what the cover is, man. I don't fucking know why, but yeah, this and born to choose were the two that were just like, this is mid nineties comp tastic world. This one is oddly really short, but it has one of my favorite pavement songs, uh, in Greenlander, which is one of their like, you know, wintry ballad, slow songs with lots of space, like strings of Nashville and Greenlander are of a piece, um, in pavements catalog. And it's the sound that's probably my favorite sound of theirs. Um, my favorite mode of pavements. I mean, like, you know, you see that born out in the way that the current or younger generations, you know, again, I'm like the last year of Gen X, but millennials and and younger you know gen z zoomers whatever like they all like me grounded was the song like on wowie the rest of wowie i thought was mostly dog shit and you know like that this these songs greenlander and and um you know strings in Nashville, which was a b-side from crooked rain from gold sounds um that whole thing they were they were like set to go in that direction i think it was just a big conflict with um with Malcolm and Spiral Stairs about like 
Malcolmus is like a goth kid. He wanted to do Echo and the Bunny Men shit. He wanted to do that kind of music, like Anglo goth stuff with with you know chorus and reverb. And Spiral Stairs didn't, and that tension is like all about what pavement was and where they met in the middle was obviously the fall because they started out banging on cardboard boxes and doing forklift and all that shit that ended up on Westing by Musket and Sextant, which is a great compilation. Um, I mean, when it came out, we were all like, ah, because you couldn't get any of those seven inches or the, the perfect sound forever 10 inch. I mean, that shit was impossible to find. So that Westing compilation was a, was a godsend. Cause at the, the moment it came out was when pavement was just blowing the fuck up everywhere. And, um, and they got away from us so fast, like pavement got away from the underground in like six months. They were no longer anybody's band. Like they were way the fuck out there all across college, you know, in the United States and, and uni in England, like the press, they like, there's bands that rock writers and, and music critics write about and just nothing happens. Cause they're not, they suck or they're, they're, they're the writer's friend. Like you can make a band your crusade all you want. If nobody gets into them, then it's fucking over. But if you're back in a band and they end up being like, you know, of that moment, the way that Jim Greer was back in the breeders in spin and, you know, Byron Coley and others were writing about pavement. It becomes the complete circle. Now, the critic is doing their function of surfacing a band that actually has potential with this audience. And so the whole thing becomes kind of real. And pavement, despite the fact that, that they've not aged well for me at all after Gary Young left the band or was kicked out. Um, I, I only like him when he's in the band. The tension of him being in the band makes the band for me. That's me. But. The, it really made them real in a way that I, I don't think people understand because I don't know if it's because you weren't there. But when Pavement played like the festival, Reading Festival and these big Brixton shows in England, it was like, yeah, they should be the next band after Nirvana that's this big because they're more academic and they're more like clever and they speak more to the depth of, of music nerddom and music geekdom than Nirvana did. Nirvana's like sensitive Axl Rose is the joke I make. Like, you know, Nirvana's Metallica without the misogynistic fan base and, and beating the crap out of you in the parking lot. You know, Metallica wasn't doing that, but their audience was, you know, essentially had, had beaten the, the, the femininity out of itself with its macho, you know, bullshit. And, and tough guy, you know, like homophobic shit, like the, the heavy metal was, was, you know, completely dominated by Cobain's music is not like it's, it's raw and shit, but like it, you know, I, anyway, the, the transition out of Nirvana into pavement and into less threatening, more sort of REM influenced bands, um, was really palpable. And, and you suddenly had this big division where the underground happened, became more underground in a reactionary way. That's why post-rock becomes big because it's more inscrutable and dramatic and difficult, right? Than you know, the stuff that you're going to see on MTV, like cut your hair or the breeders cannonball, because that's stuff like tweens are listening to tweens are starting to buy doc Martens, you know, like, I was, you know, like 14, 15 when this, well, no, I was 16 when, when Nevermind came out, but like I heard them when I was, anyway, you know, the, the bands that go across to, to really younger kids because they're just not, there's, there's no homework. There's no prerequisites, right? Well, when you get into your twenties, like in your college, you know, and your independence, like now you want stuff that's like, you know like I get this, you know, it starts, you start to get these airs of, of, you know, the, the music needing this and, um, this, this sophistication or this, this, um, you know, dramatic sweep or this theory or whatever behind it. And so all that stuff, like, you know, low and karate and, uh, all these bands that are getting resurfaced lately, um, you know, there's a willfulness to the music itself that is a rejection of the music having any commercial potential, which is just bizarre. It, it, it's, it's music that is so totally self-indulgent, but informed by a love of music and inspired to make a decision 
based on everything that these artists knew and felt about music, this was their territory they were going to come out and explore in their band. And it was just so incredibly, um, it just, it had no appeal outside of the music scene. And so in America, it very much is about the scene, just like punk and hardcore and everything else. It's a scene stir thing. It's, you got to know the right people. You got to get the right zines. You got to write the right letters, get your seven inch reviewed. And it's that scene stir thing that always drove me fucking nuts. I hate that. I've always hated it. It's been what I've railed against. Like when I was railing against things, um, my whole, you know, online, whatever presence, um, and looking back on it is very strange because I participated in it. You know, um, I was in tons of like stupid, snobby, indie bullshit bands that never went anywhere. Um, but anyway, um, you know, a uh, couple, a couple live cuts again, that's a cheap ass thing. Like, you know, but helmet live anywhere you can get it, get it. Um, this is a pretty cowboy junkie song too. I'm a massive cowboy junkies fan. Another band where, you know, we'll do a bag on them maybe, but it wouldn't, it would go so quickly because you can get everything they've ever done for nothing. Uh, and most of it is, has value. Um, but yeah, we're coming up on the end. So, um, you know, uh, I'll, I'll finish with another kind of mainstreamy compilation that, that, that was also big right around the time of born to choose and, and no alternative, which was the Victoria Williams benefit sweet relief. This is another alternative rock compilation. Um, you know, you're getting all the big names. Uh, everyone came out for her. Um, you know, is it all good? No, but there's some really incredible outstanding stuff. The water boys. Why look at the moon is like an absolute must. Um, Evan Dando's acoustic version of frying pan where he walks out of the studio at the end. I listen to this all the time. And I mean, Victoria Williams has a very specific, um, you know, whatever thing, like she, she is a, such a unique voice and there's that whole, you know, twirling dress, you know, um, kind of clever girl thing, uh, at the fair kind of, you know, country Southern Midwestern drawl. Like she's a, a whole package and a whole presentation, uh, in, in her voice and in her and herself that comes through in her music. And what happens on this, you know, initial one, there's another one, I believe, but this one is, is massively Canon. And again, you can get it for anywhere for less than a dollar. Um, hearing all these other bands, you know, there are artists like this that are so I, you know, individualistic and iconoclastic maybe, but, um, so unique. And, and when you hear their songwriting translated out of their natural, you know, native, you know, born with personality and voice by other artists, you, you get this totally different impression and appreciation. For me, um, it, the water boys, while I look at the moon is it's, it's short and everything. Cause her songs are mostly short. Um, really shocked me. I, I just, I found and was able to f hear and feel so much more, um, of that song as a result of that cover. Um, you know, the rest of this, you know, the shutter to think animal wild is pretty good. Um, Buffalo Tom's merry ground is, is like, it's Buffalo Tom. If you've never heard him, I mean, it's like, it's gravelly voiced power pop by Bill Janovitz from, uh, I think he's from Marlboro or Attleboro, Massachusetts, right around me. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, you know, there's, there's some great stuff, um, on this and it's, it's one you can get for nothing. I stand for Maria McKee, uh, total belter who worked with the wrong material apart from three lone justice jam. Yeah. I mean, she's actually an interesting case. Um, you know, so if you don't know the story of, of Maria McKee, she was the singer in a band um, called Lone Justice, who has one of the weirdest stories in the history of pop music. Um, and I, I, if I had known I was going to talk about it, I would have researched it. But this was so, you know, you're coming out of the Paisley underground period on the West Coast. And so kind of country ish tinged, um, you know, planes feeling big songs had this thing going on. Now, Lone Justice was like, apart from her, uh, not a band that was selling a lot of posters, let's say, uh, in terms of the pinup quality. Um, she was obviously stunning, beautiful. Jimmy Iovine had done this record off, of, off the demo, 
And what happened was it was the same story as the Sex Pistols. Like the Sex Pistols only got on the Bill Grundy show because Queen canceled. Lone Justice got put on Saturday Night Live because someone canceled. I think it was Madonna. Was it Madonna? I can't remember. But man, the, it was so crazy out of nowhere. Like within, like I think it was like two days notice. They went and performed on SNL. Uh, and it moved units like crazy for this record for Geffen, which was, ba you know, a, a, Geffen had been around for like, what, three years at that point as a label. I think Geffen's first release was Peter Gabriel's Security, if I'm not wrong, something around that time. Um, so Lone Justice was one of the first like new bands Geffen was trying to work. And, um, you know, yeah, I mean, you, you, JR said, you know, Moby Grape of the 80s. I could totally see that, you know, um, when you think about that. Uh, um, uh, what, what's, uh, you know, things I forget. Um, the album, uh, blah, 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 blah. I can't tell her. It's like my favorite song ever. I'm not willing. Um, you know, Moby Grape 69, man, this is a, it's, it's a bit of a controversial record among fans cause it's a big turn, but this song, I am not willing. If you've never heard it, fucking life changing, uh, crushing ballad. One of the most painful, powerful, like it's like Gene Clark 75. Like there's so much stuff from, from this kind of mode and sound that if you haven't heard, I am not willing, man, this, this will haunt you for life. Um, that it's like on the beach, Neil Young. It's, it's exactly that crazy powerful. Um, and I was thinking specifically of, of Gene Clark's 1975 on white light. That's another one, like, you know, a little, little three pack for you of, uh, of songs to check out that will probably, shake your shit up and you'll never forget um but yeah lone justice didn't do anything my part lone justice did not do well and then it was like well the classic thing that happens you know jimmy Iovine probably pulls maria mckee aside and is like listen what would you think about going solo and we're just gonna put your gorgeous face on this album <laughs> and we're gonna do you know ballads and we're gonna i'm gonna pull stuff from every i mean it, you know it, it happens every time like i said there's no doubt Maria Ke Maria McKee was carrying the dudes in Lone Justice. Um, but, you know, they did two records and then she went solo and like it just never went anywhere. But she's a great singer. Um, just really, really never ended up with a, a ton of consistently strong material. I mean, Moby Grape of the 80s is maybe a little strong, JR. But I hear you. Um, it's, it's a cool record. I mean, look, it's very mannered. It's very mid 80s. I mean, you know, I mean, this makes... <laughs> Uh, this makes prefab sprout sound like sun raw. I mean, it's, it's, it's about as middle of the road as you're going to get. Um, but there's some good, there's some good cuts. I mean, um, I can't remember the, the, the two they did. Um, I think after the flood was the single, if I'm not wrong, um, ways to be wicked was the single that I'm wrong. <laughs> not a shock. So sweet, sweet baby, I'm falling and, and ways to be wicked with singles. But I, these, those must've been the two that they did on SNL. But, uh, man, it's so funny. You know, it's like, it's just immediately you, you think, of, I think of the Sundays in terms of the way this band is presented. It's like, let's get Harriet Wheeler out here um, because, you know, she's totally gorgeous and the rest of these guys are anorak, you know, whatever. It's like three Stephen Merchants behind Harriet Wheeler. That did not work out too good uh, long term for the Sundays. And like when you see the videos, it's hilarious, man. It's like the camera's always moving when they're filming the dudes. Like, yeah. Anyway. Um, so we're coming up on eight o'clock. I tried to keep these to an hour because I just, it's, you know, realistically, this is, this is all, uh, I can, I can do. And we, we're trying to, you know, schedule this and see if we can't keep it going over time. See if it builds any audience. I found out <laughs> I'm gonna have to figure out how to do that. I have to, I have to download and upload these for them to be videos on the channel. Otherwise they stay in the live tab and people think it's an empty channel. So unfortunately it means a little more work on my end, but that's fine. Um, so we'll get this one capped off. I may, I may just come back on Sunday and just do more comps, um, for a little bit and just go on a tear on comps. Um, cause again, you know, like, yeah, this is about finding value, but it's also about explaining, you know, where to look and what to look for. Um, compilations are not necessarily something where you're going to find a seller that has all of these at once. So this is really sort of like a list making exercise. Like in many respects, it's things you just want to earmark as you're going through bigger stores where you've got a, you know, a deep bench of CDs under five bucks. A lot of these compilations will come up um, for for pennies on the dollar and are and are definitely worth it. You know, I mean, my thing is like, look, if you're if you're paying two bucks for a CD and it has one good song, win. I'll take that. 
um, you know, I'll go, I'll go for that every time. Just it, it's versus, you know, the, what you're paying monthly for all these streaming services and stuff to have it, to create the digital store and then have yourself, you know, a reasonably sized object, um, you know, to get your collection going. This is, you know, it's a specific thing. Yeah. And, and Cole, before I go, there's no question. We'll go heavy into the volume series. If I do another compilations one, those were, um, I could, they were unbelievable. They came with like books and I mean like a hundred page CD size books and they had incredibly rare shit. I mean, for a decade, the only place you could get circling girl by Cocteau twins was on a volume CD. Um, so that's something we'll definitely go into. I mean, I didn't even bring up, I don't think any UK compilations and it's like, they started it with now. Um, and I have the, the first, I mentioned the last stream, I have the first now CD. So yeah, maybe on Sunday, um, when we do the two o'clock stream, which is better timed for EU, UK and rest of the world, I'll pull together some, some of those compilations. Um, and actually maybe I'll just bring a little stack too, so I can hold them up and, uh, and we'll, we'll focus on that side of the pond. Cause I mean, we started with New Zealand here with Tuatara with flying nun, but, um, you know, this was pretty heavily on American Indie cause it was such a flavor of that, uh, in the nineties. So yeah, everybody, thanks for tuning in. I'm going to shut it down and, and, uh, I'm, uh, before we get to Sunday, I'll, uh, I'll get these all put together and up this video. So the channel starts to function, uh, the, you know, the right way. So, uh, yeah, thanks for watching.